Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading White Fang by Jack London. Without further ado, returning to White Fang as read by Lord Naren White. He watched them closely as they shouldered the luggage and were led off down the hill by Matt, who carried the bedding and the grip. But White Fang did not follow them. The master was still here, was still in the cabin. After a time, Matt returned. The master came to the door and called White Fang inside. You poor devil, he said gently, rubbing White Fang's ears and tapping his spine. I'm hitting the long trail, old man, where you cannot follow. Now give me a growl, the last good, goodbye growl. But White Fang refused to growl. Instead, after a wistful, searching look, he snuggled in, burrowing his head out of sight between the master's arm and body. There she blows, Matt cried. From the Yukon arose the hoarse bellowing of a river steamboat. You've got to cut it short. Be sure and lock the front door. I'll go out the back, get a move on. The two doors slammed at the same moment and Whedon Scott waited for Matt to come around to the front. From inside the door came a low whining and sobbing. Then when there were long, deep-drawn sniffs. Then there were long, deep-drawn sniffs. You must take good care of him, Matt, Scott said, as they started down the hill. Ride and let me know how he gets along. Sure, the dog musher answered. But listen to that, will you? Both men stopped. White Fang was howling as dogs howl when their masters lie dead. He was voicing an utter woe, his cry bursting upward in great heart-breaking rushes, dying down into quavering misery and bursting upward again with a rush upon rush of grief. The Aurora was the first steamboat of the year for the outside, and her decks were jammed with prosperous adventurers and broken gold seekers all equally as mad to get to the outside as they had been originally to get to the inside. Near the gangplank, Scott was shaking hands with Matt, who was preparing to go ashore. But Matt's hand went limp in the other grasp as his gaze shot past and remained fixed on something behind him. Scott turned to see. Sitting on the deck several feet away and watching wistfully was White Fang. The dog musher swore softly, in awe-stricken accents. Scott could only look in wonder. Did you lock the front door? Matt demanded. The other nodded and asked, How about the back? You just bet I did, was the fervent reply. White Fang flattered his ears ingratiatingly, but remained where he was, making no attempt to approach. I'll have to take him ashore with me. Matt made a couple of steps toward White Fang, but the latter slid away from him. The dog musher made a rush of it, and White Fang dodged between the legs of a group of men. Ducking, turning, doubling, he slid about the deck, eluding the other's efforts to capture him. But when the love master spoke, White Fang came to him with prompt obedience. Won't come to the hand that's fed him all these months, the dog musher muttered resentfully. And you, you ain't never fed him after them first days of getting acquainted. I'm blamed if I can see how it works out when you're the boss. Scott, who had been patting White Fang, suddenly bent closer and pointed out fresh made cuts on his muzzle and a gash between the eyes. Matt bent over and passed his hand along White Fang's belly. We plump forgot the window. He's all cut and gouged underneath. Must have butted clean through it, by gosh. But Whedon Scotts was not listening. He was thinking rapidly. The Aurora's whistle hooted a final announcement of desire. Men were scurrying down the gangplank to the shore. Matt loosened the bandana from his own neck and started to put it around white fangs. Scott grasped the dog musher's hand. Goodbye, Matt, old man. About the wolf, you needn't write. You see, I've... What? The dog musher exploded. You don't mean to say... 
the very thing I mean. Here's your bandana. I'll write to you about him. Matt paused halfway down the gangplank. He'll never stand the climate, he shouted back, unless you clip him in warm weather. The gangplank was hauled in, and the aurora swung out from the bank. Weed and Scott waved a last goodbye. Then he turned and bent over White Fang, standing by his side. Now growl, damn you, growl, he said, as he patted the responsive head and rubbed the flattening ears. Chapter 2 The Southland White Fang landed from the steamer in San Francisco. He was appalled. Deep in him, below any reasoning process or act of consciousness, he had associated power with Godhead, and never had the white men seemed such marvelous gods as now, when he trod the slimy pavement of San Francisco. The log cabins he had known were replaced by towering buildings. The streets were crowded with perils, wagons, carts, automobiles, great straining horses pulling huge trucks, and monstrous cable and electric cars hooting and clanging through the mists, screeching their insistent menace after the manner of the lynxes he had known in the northern woods. All this was the manifestation of power. Through it all, behind it all, was man, governing and controlling, expressing himself as of old by his mastery over matter. It was colossal, stunning. White Fang was awed. Fear sat upon him. As in his cubhood he had been made to feel his smallness and puniness on the day he first came in from the wild to the village of Grey Beaver. So now, in his full-grown stature and pride of strength, he was made to feel small and puny. And there were so many gods. He was made dizzy by the swarming of them. The thunder of the street smote upon his ears. He was bewildered by the tremendous and endless rush and movement of things. As never before, he felt his dependence on the loved master, close at whose heels he followed, no matter what happened, never losing sight of him. But White Fang was more was to have more than no more than nightmare vision of the city, an experience that was like a bad dream, unreal and terrible, that haunted him for long after in his dreams. He was put into a baggage car by the master, chained in a corner in the midst of heaped trunks and valises. Here a squad and brawny god held sway, with much noise, hurling trunks and boxes about, dragging them in through the door and tossing them into piles, or flinging them out of the door and smashing and crashing to other gods who awaited them. And here, in this inferno of luggage, was White Fang deserted by the master. Or at least White Fang thought he was deserted, until he smiled out the master's canvas clothes, bags alongside of him, and proceeded to mount guard over them. About time you come, growled the god of the car an hour later, when Whedon Scott appeared at the door. The dog of your won't let me lay a finger on your stuff. White Fang emerged from the car. He was astonished. The nightmare city was gone. The car had been to him no more than a room in the house. And when he had entered, it, it, the city had been all around him. In the interval, the city had disappeared. The roar of it no longer dinned upon his ears. Before him was smiling country, streaming with sunshine, lazy with quietude. But he had little time to marvel at the, tra at the transformation. He accepted it as he accepted all the unaccountable things and doings of manifestations, doings and manifestations of the God. It was their way. There was a carriage waiting. A man and a woman approached the master. The woman's arms went out and clutched the master around the neck, a hostile act. The next moment, when Whedon Scott had torn loose from the embrace and closed with White Fang, who had become a snarling, raging demon. It's all right, mother, Scott was saying as he kept tight hold of White Fang and placated them. He thought you were going to injure me, and he wouldn't stand for it. It's all right, it's all right, he'll learn soon enough. And in the meantime, I may be permitted to love my son when his dog is not around, she laughed. 
though she was pale and weak from the fright. She looked at White Fang, who snarled and bristled and glared malevolently. He'll have to learn, and he shall without postponement, Scott said. He spoke softly to White Fang until he had quieted him. Then his voice became firm. Down, sir, down with you. This had been one of the things taught him by the master, and White Fang obeyed, though he lay down reluctantly and sullenly. Now, mother? Scott opened his arms to her, but kept his eyes on White Fang. Down, he warned, down! White Fang, bristling silently, half crouching as he rose, sank back and watched the hostile act repeated. But no harm came of it, nor of the embrace from the strange man-god that followed. Then the clothes bags were taken into the carriage. The strange gods and the love master followed, and White Fang pursued, now running vigilantly behind, now bristling up to the running horses, and warning them that he was there to see that no harm befell the god they dragged so swiftly across the earth. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.